All right. Hey, guys, welcome. Uh, playing to win episode number 88. Uh, my friend George Gammon returns. How you doing, George? Doing well, Rich. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, it's cool to catch up every, uh, you know, I said last time I'd love to have you on like every six or seven months just to sort of, you know, see what's going on with the markets because, uh, you know, they're always changing and, um, you know, it's always it's always neat to sort of dive down those conversations. And we always, I mean, we we talk about more than just markets and economics anyway, because I know that you're, you know, you're pretty red pilled with the way that you live your life and everything. So it's fun to have you on. Um, before we actually get started, I, I had a challenge for one of my friends because he, because he saw the post that I put up with the event and he wanted me to table this for you. Okay. Um, and he said, will you ask George how much longer he's going to be completely wrong about the market? Uh, so I said to him, all right, well, you know, which anything market? In detail, the stock market? yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I said to him, so anything in detail that you want me to raise and they said, okay, so there's so many things, but I'll simplify. So for those of you that are sort of like newer to my channel, like George Gaiman, you know, he runs a rebel capitalist conference. He's got a couple YouTube channels. He talks a lot about economics. He's a real estate investor. He's friends with guys like Robert Kiyosaki. He's a pretty cool dude. Right. So, um, he, you know, he puts out a lot of this, uh, content around money and what's going on and sort of like like from the from the perspective of an unplugged male sort of looking at the code in the matrix you know sort of thing i think is probably the best way to describe it would you say yeah absolutely yeah. i mean what you do with uh the the dynamics between men and women uh you know looking at the code in the matrix i try to do the exact same thing with macroeconomics yeah yeah with the markets so he okay so he said uh so many but i'll simplify it's down to two he goes uh that would probably be best to ask off the live feed he goes one does he really believe the U.S. economy, the dollar, and the housing market, et cetera, are going to collapse, or does he just promote conspiracy theories for, to get clicks? If he actually does believe it, what is the timeline? Where do we begin, Rich? Sorry, sorry to corny your <laughs> brother, but you know, like I love you guys both, and I think oh, it's a no, great where do we begin? Conversation. First of all, like, what I, I would suggest this guy do before asking questions is just try watching a few of my videos. I think he has. I mean, he's actually a no. He has. He's a he, he he's, has. He's a money he manager rich. guy. No, he actually hasn't. I, okay. The reason I can tell you he hasn't is because I'm not talking about the dollar crashing. Okay. In fact, for the last, geez, for the last year on my channel, I've been talking about how the dollar will not crash. Okay. Uh, and I've been talking about how most likely go up, especially if we get a global economic recession and i talked about the dynamics and the mechanics behind the global monetary system which would prevent the dollar from outright collapsing now in fact in a video the other day i argued that even if the dollar lost reserve currency status it may not collapse because so many dollars outside of the united states are created in a way where the supply creates its own demand so i, I hate to get too far into the weeds but to mm -hmm. answer your buddy's question uh, when a uh, there's a couple different ways that currency or a dollar can be created, uh, it can be printed by the government where they actually literally print a green piece of paper, mm -hmm. and that would be what I consider a supply dollar. So that dollar is just supply. It's just an asset on someone's balance sheet. It's not simultaneously a liability. But the majority of the currency units, especially the dollars, because the dollar is the world reserve currency, and we have something called the euro dollar system. So the the dollar is. Uh, you know, represents 60, 70 percent of global transactions, the way they're settled. So the majority of the dollars are outside of the United States and they're created by banks lending them into existence. So if you need a home loan, Rich, you go to the bank, you go to, mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever the local bank is there. Let's just say it's Wells Fargo. That's a popular one in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you take out a loan for $500,000. Those dollars didn't exist prior. They mm -hmm. just they put those dollars, bam, it's in your account. Uh, it's now a liability of the mm -hmm. bank. And you can take those dollars and spend them how you please. Uh, you buy the house. And then the offsetting asset on the bank's balance sheet is a loan that has to be paid back. So are you so, saying that, 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 that any financial institution in the world that's tied into the U.S. or the U.S. reserve currency can manufacture dollars? Like, can, can a Canadian bank like CIBC, for example, if they wanted to issue me a half million dollar or sorry, half million U.S. dollar loan generate that in U.S. dollars out of thin air? Not all banks, but a lot of the banks outside of the United States can. And that's okay. what we call the network of the euro dollar system. So these are banks, and this system started back in the 1950s, and it was a result of Bretton Woods. 
uh, because back then, you know, the dollar officially became the global reserve currency. So in order to grow your economy at full capacity, you needed enough dollars, but there weren't enough dollars getting outside of the United States because we weren't running a trade deficit. We were running a trade surplus. So these banks and these corporations outside the US, they had a big problem. You know, how do we settle in dollars if, if, if we can't get any outside the United States? So they started mm -hmm. creating their own, quite literally. And so this is a system that has been in place since the 1950s that operates with no bank reserves. And for those of your audience, those uh, members of your audience who are a little more sophisticated, you'll know that that's just base money. That's the Federal Reserve. When they quote unquote print money, that mm -hmm. would be base money. That would be bank reserves. So nor there's no bank reserves and there's no green pieces of paper. There's no dollars in the system at all. But yet they create dollars in the form of commercial bank liabilities. So, but they but they lend them into existence. So the, the key there, Rich, is the fact that the bank has to lend it into existence means that those currency units have been created, but a liability, a future liability for those same currency units plus interest has also been created. Because at some time you've got to pay, you've got to get those dollars back to pay off the loan. You see, mm -hmm. where if you just have a green piece of paper, that's just an asset on mm -hmm. a balance sheet. That is not a simultaneous liability. So when you think about the fact that there are 50, 60, maybe even more, I would argue there's probably $100 trillion off balance sheet and on balance sheet globally. Is that, and, is that number tracked anywhere? Like, is that public information as far no, as how much it is? No, it's very, very difficult to track because so many of these euro dollar banks operate in the shadows. So you really don't know what's on their balance sheet. And you definitely don't know what they have off balance sheet, just interbank. That's dollars be between one another. So when you think about this, it, you, what I like to do on my videos is think about a global aggregate balance sheet. So an aggregate balance sheet for the entire world, right? You think about, okay, you got assets on the left, you got liabilities on the right. Let's just assume that there's a hundred trillion dollars cash. That's an asset on the balance sheet. But you also, since the majority of that was lent into existence, you've got a hundred trillion dollars of liabilities meaning future demand for those dollars. So even if you have the dollar, let's say go from Saudi Arabia because they're using a new currency, you know, the BRICS currency, everyone's talked about that. They're de-dollarizing. Okay, what's, great. Sorry, so that's the BRICS currency? Well, everyone's talking about how the BRIC countries are going to create their own currency. Oh, okay. They might back it by gold so they can de-dollarize. This is Russian, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, China. Exactly. Brazil. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's a very good argument. They're definitely de-dollarizing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the dollar crashes because even if those dollars leave the balance sheet of Saudi Arabia, they go somewhere else and the aggregate balance sheet doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And the only way that the liability side goes down is if you pay off those loans, which reduces the amount of currency units that are circulating, chasing goods and services. Mm. You see, so I, I guess the, that's kind of a long winded answer that explains the euro dollar system to a certain degree and the global monetary system but that's why your viewers if you're they're expecting the dollar to crash um now it might go down now as an example if you have an interest rate differential like let's assume for a moment that the bank of japan and the the, the ecb uh increase interest rates or continued increase rates where here in the united states for some reason the fed takes rates from five percent overnight down to you know, 1% or something. So there's an extreme interest rate differential. Yeah, you'll likely see the dollar go down. You know, right now it's trading at about 103 on the DXY, uh, which is just a dollar against a basket of other currencies. In that scenario, you might see the dollar trade down, you know, maybe 90, uh, 80. But let's remember that back in 2011, 2012, the dollar was trading at 70, mm -hmm. 70 on the DXY. And was anybody, was everyone talking about the dollar losing the reserve currency status back? No, of course not. And it didn't lose the reserve status, even though it went down to 70. So I think the probability, Rich, is actually higher that right now, let's say we're at 100, you know, right around 103. I think the probability is higher, especially over the next year, that we're definitely facing a global, uh, a global economic slowdown. I would say maybe even a global economic recession or depression. Mm. I'd say there's a higher probability that the dollar goes to 130 on the DXY then going down to 70. Mm -hmm. And 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 by the way, since we've heard all of this talk about de-dollarization and the BRICS currencies and everything that we've been hearing about in the news, what has the dollar done? It's actually gone up. You know, we started around 101, now it's at 103. 
I mean, it, 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 you think that the FX markets, the guys who trade, they don't understand about this BRICS currency. Mm -hmm. They don't understand about de-dollarization. Of course they do. But you got to look at how people are placing their money, not just what they're talking about. I mean, you say this all the time on your channel in regards to women, but it's mm -hmm. the exact same thing with the marketplace. Don't listen to what they say. Listen to what they do. Yeah, and if we're looking at how people are actually trading dollars, they're bullish on the dollar. They're not bearish. Is it is it the same with other currencies like the euro, for example? Can the U.S. manufacturers euros out of thin air and yep. generate loans um, for the European currency? In the yeah, it's a great question. And it, it is true. So when I say euro dollars, a lot of people think that that's like has to do with the euro currency, but it actually doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it just implies that it's within this network of banks that aren't under really a purview of any central bank and that they operate kind of, I'd say in the shadows because it sounds like something nefarious, but it's really not. But it is true to your point. They can create euro dollars. They can create euro euros. They can create euro yen mm -hmm. for that matter. Interesting. Okay. Um, sorry, let me go back to the original thing. So you mentioned economy dollar and housing market. Um, do you, well, the housing market, let's go over the yeah, housing market. Sure. Go. So what, so my, my, my prediction there has been that we will, <clears throat> excuse me, that the prices in the United States will have to revert back down to where they were in 2012, mm -hmm. but that's in real terms. So it, it, your audience might know this, might not know this, Rich, I know, uh, you understand this, but in real terms, you have to adjust for inflation. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying in nominal terms that prices will go back down to where they were in 2012. But in real terms, I think they will. And these cycles take a long time to shift. You know, you look at when we peaked out in 2006, we bottomed out in 2012. So it took six years to go from peak all the way back down to where it bottomed out. And it bottomed out in the summer of 2012. I'm talking about the U.S. real estate market. Mm -hmm. So this time around, I think that you'll go back down to those levels. Why do I say that? Because at the end of the day, uh, housing prices are mostly due to wages and interest rates. So we know interest rates are going back up. They're normalizing. Mm -hmm. So unless you have real wages go up, the people can't afford the homes. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, those homes have to start coming down in value. So uh, we yeah. and we see this happening right now in the United States. I did a video the other day on how the, they listed the top 100 markets in the United States as far as nominal prices. And uh, from 75 to 100, they're all down year over year. And uh, a lot of them are are, are down uh, quarter over quarter. But that's in nominal terms. Once you adjust for real terms, pretty much uh, other than the top 20 markets, in the top 100, so there's 80 markets that are actually underwater over the last year when you adjust for the rate of inflation. So that was a prediction that I made that I would argue uh, is coming true. The dollar prediction, I think, is coming true. Now, if you want to look at the stock market, uh, what I've been saying there is that we will have a stock market crash. Now, why do I say that? Because it goes back to something called the yield curve. So the yield curve, uh, you can look at this, and and actually, let me explain it first. You've got mm -hmm. the the 10-year treasury and the two-year treasury. So that's the most common uh, two uh, maturities used to determine this curve, although you can use a three-month, 10-year, a one-year, 10-year, et cetera. But uh, the most common is the two-year, 10-year. And if we take that all the way back to 1950, Rich, every single time the here, the curve inverts, meaning that the interest rate, the yield on the two-year is higher than the 10-year, you get a recession. It happened every single time with the exception of 1964, 1965, and GDP still went down significantly during that time frame. So you're talking about 10 out of 11 times. It's one of the most powerful macro predictors that we have. So, but what's tough is kind of the timing involved there. Yeah, I was but gonna the ask bottom, you what's the timeline for that? Yeah, so usually it's about uh, I would say, especially with the three the three month and the ten years, a little bit better at timing. And so when that inverts, usually you get a recession. The stuff hits the fan between six months and eighteen months. So let's just call it an average of about a year. And that three month and ten year inverted about eight months ago. Uh, so we're getting close to, if we look at a historic average, when we should start seeing that stuff hit the fan, which you would notice by the unemployment rate 
uh, starting to spike. So usually uh, when you get this inversion, the stock market doesn't go straight down. Usually it actually goes up, especially when you look at the last 30 years. But what happens is when the curve is no longer inverted, when it steepens out, meaning that the two-year yield goes back down below the 10-year, and usually that happens as a result of the Fed dropping rates, that's when the majority of the stock market crash actually happens. So I've been saying this on my channel nonstop for the last eight months. I'm not saying that there's going to be a stock market crash tomorrow. But what I'm saying is that we have to pay attention to that curve is inverted. We've got to be risk off maybe a little bit more in cash, maybe build up that dry powder, because when the curve is no longer inverted, then that's usually when the stock market goes down. And that's when you take that dry powder and buy things on the cheap. The, the um, I want to go back to the, to the, to the real estate market. Cause I've been seeing a lot of these um, guys on social media and I hate to say it on TikTok of all places, but they'll <laughs> go and take like, Oh, Florida real estate. You can have this five bedroom house with three bath and granite countertops and 10 foot ceilings and a pool and two acres and all this stuff for like 1.7 million. Right. And it looks bomb. And then they go and compare it to a Toronto piece of real estate, which is a shoebox in the middle of the city for yeah, like yeah. 2.5 million, like a literal shoebox, like a piece of shit. And the, the, the real estate market in the U S is still <clears throat> compared to the Canadian market, like your dollar goes way farther, even though the exchange rate's not in our favor, it still goes farther down in the States than what it does over here. Like they've been saying that the markets here should be correcting, or you would have thought they would have done so by now. Cause they've been saying it for five, six, seven years now, like, you know, we yeah. got to cool this off and they do whatever they can. And they, you know, they change for foreign investments. So the Asian investors can't be buying property and sitting on them vacant, stuff like this. It never seems to correct though. Right. What do you say to those guys that just keep seeing the trend go up and up and up and up? Like it, like it sort of stabilizes for a bit, skips around, and then it kind of goes up and it stabilizes, and it kind of goes up, sort of thing. And it's like, you know, with the markets being so much cheaper in the states, still comparatively speaking to a lot of markets, how does that play out? Or well, I think what you that'll play out. Yeah. So first and foremost, I think just because the Canadian real estate market's in a massive bubble, it doesn't mean that the United States market isn't in a bubble. It, it's just, you know, you're, you're kind of sifting through your dirty laundry and trying to find the cleanest shirt. <laughs> that mean the shirt's <laughs> clean. Uh, but, but I would also kind of suggest the person take a step back and ask, what is my investment strategy? Right. And I think this is crucial. So my personal investment strategy is to completely ignore price direction. And this is the opposite. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that retail investors make. Mm -hmm. So they sit there and they base all their decisions on what they think the price is going to do. So as an example, if I think that prices of uh, Florida real estate, if I think they're going to go up, then I'm going to buy. If I think they're going to go down, then I'm going to sell. In my opinion, my favorite investor of all time is Jim Rogers. So that's why I quote him all the time. This is his quote. Mm. He always used to say that's a quick way to the poor house. Mm. And uh, why is it? Because you, no one can ever predict these things. You can sit there and say that the price of Tesla stock is going up or down or Bitcoin or blah, 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 blah. And you, you really don't know. The only thing that's knowable is whether or not something is cheap or expensive based on its historical price adjusted for inflation, or in the case of real estate, based on the cash flow, right? So I, so I never, ever, ever start by asking myself the question, do I think the price of XYZ asset will go up or down? I always start by asking myself, is the price cheap? And if the price isn't cheap, I just say, next, mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. I could have the greatest argument on the planet as to why the price will continue to go up. But if it's not cheap, I'm not going to buy. And I think if people could just step back and forget about price direction and, and base their investment decisions solely based on buying things when they're cheap and selling them when they're expensive, they're going to do a heck of a lot better. And they're going to, they're going to increase the probability 
that they adhere to the number one rule in investing, and that's don't lose money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I because I've watched a few um, crypto videos in the last week, and it seems like they're going into this new trend of oh, we're ramping up for another bull market. Oh, the BlackRock ETF is coming for Bitcoin. Uh, oh, the halving is coming. You're going to see this thing blow up in the next, you know, they start talking about the next yeah. coins that are going to blow up in the next bull market sort of thing. And they start creating a lot of anxiety and FOMO in it. And oh, yeah. uh, what do you think it, about stuff it, like it. that? Like all that hype? It's nonsense. It's just, it's nonsense. I mean, I think that everyone should own Bitcoin. Is that because I think the price is going to go to a million or, you know, it's going to be the global currency? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I think those probabilities are completely separate questions. I just think that you should own Bitcoin to have some purchasing power outside of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going into a world of central bank digital currencies, as an example, which we could talk about if you like, mm -hmm. uh, it is very wise to have purchasing power outside of the system, even if the price doesn't go up. Mm -hmm. So I don't really look at uh, Bitcoin as an investment or a way to get rich or something like that, like most people do. I look at it as an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. I look at it as an insurance policy to maintain my freedom and to be able to take some of my purchasing power wherever I want to go on earth. You know, And if you look back at 2020, I think people need to start asking themselves that question mm -hmm. because you know I was in Colombia. I mean, both you and I, Rich, have access to quite a few resources. Uh, whether it's financial resources or a community of, of guys and gals that we know that are, uh, you know, have, let's say, are, are, are powerful that could pull strings, right? But I'd like to suggest all of your uh, viewers ask yourself the question, you know, regardless of how much money you had, how much freedom did you have in 2020? Yeah, that's a great point. Right. And if you don't have any freedom, are you rich or are you poor? Yeah. Right, you could have a, a a ten billion dollars, but if you're on a deserted island, or if you're in jail, you're poor, man. You're poor. You've you've warmed up a little bit more to Bitcoin from when I originally met you. Like you were you were more or less indifferent, you know. It seemed than I think. Like, did that have something to do with the talk and the introduction of the uh, governments bringing in CBDCs? No, I've always had, maybe I didn't uh, articulate it well last time we spoke, but I've always pretty much had the same position on, on Bitcoin. I've owned it for a long, long time. Uh, if, if I bought it as a speculative asset, uh, I would wait until I saw uh, panic in the market. Uh, that's another thing that Jim Rogers always used to say that I've tried to take to heart is you, you buy panic and sell hysteria. Mm-hmm. So when you're talking, you know, when you just are, when you just uh, discussed how, or when you just um, uh, described how all these crypto guys are saying, hey, this is the next best thing, and this is going to be this, and oh my gosh, BlackRock, and blah, 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 blah. That's an example of hysteria. That is not an example of panic. So another example I use is like the Bitcoin conference down in Miami. Mm -hmm. So last year, or in 2021, maybe, they had like 30,000 people there, okay? Uh, this year, 15,000. Mm. So I would way rather buy Bitcoin when there's 15,000 at the Bitcoin conference than 30. In fact, I would way, 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 way rather buy when there was 1,000 people at the Bitcoin conference. <laughs> that's, we... that's panic. You buy panic, you sell hysteria. So, But again, we want to compartmentalize there, Rich, because I'm talking about the same asset. Yeah. But I'm talking about buying it for two completely, completely separate reasons. And yeah. one of the main things that people need to understand how to do, one of the best ways to have an edge as an investor is to be really, really good at portfolio construction. Speaking of portfolio construction, the, the second question that my friend had uh, that he wanted me to pose to you is what stocks or investments have you personally bought over the last 12 months? I know that last time we talked, I think you were interested the in- The only in... thing I've purchased in the last, I'm trying to think here, the, the last 12 months, the only thing I've purchased is gold and T-bills. That's it. Mm. Are you still, because um, I think you were hot on, on things like coal and some other commodities, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, uranium? 
I think was Absolutely. the other one too. Yeah. Absolutely. But but to be clear, I would not buy right now, Rich, because again, you got to think about this, right? Mm. You've got an industrial metal, let's say like silver. Silver is one that's that's very, very popular, you know, within the space. Okay, if if we're if we've got an inverted yield curve, it's a, a hundred basis point inversion right now. It, it, that suggests that we're not just going to have a soft landing; we're going to have a hard landing type of recession, something that could be very similar to the GFC. Okay, is that when that plays out? Is that good for GFC, commodities? What's that? The global financial crisis that okay. we had in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Okay. So if we see something like that play out, which is what the yield curve is predicting, mm. you know, do, does silver go up or down in that environment? It goes straight down. Does oil go down? Uranium, coal, all of these commodities will go down. So now that doesn't mean that I don't like them long term. Long term, I love them because I think that we are in a huge commodity super cycle. But things never go up in a straight line. So I'm sitting back looking at the yield curve. And I'm just building up my cash position. That's why I buy all the T bills because you're getting paid five, five and a half percent mm-hmm. just to sit there in a one month or a three month T bill and just roll it over and just collect the interest while you're just waiting. And you got that liquid ash- asset, basically a cash equivalent. Mm-hmm. So I want to sit back and just be patient. In fact, I did a video the other day where I talked about the top, uh, I think the top three assets to have going into a recession. And the number one asset that I went over in that video was patience. <laughs> patience. You got to sit and just do nothing. And that's so hard for people to do because they always want to be out you know, chasing shiny objects and everything. Mm-hmm. But no, you have a long-term view. And my long-term view is that we're in a commodity super cycle. So you sit back, you wait, you do nothing. You build your cash position while you're making 5%. And then when things get cheap, because of a recession, as an example, when coal gets cheap, when uranium gets cheap, and I'm I'm basing cheap based on its historic price adjusted for inflation, then you go in and take action. Then you buy. But you got to build up that cash position to have that dry powder to be able to pull the trigger and take advantage of that opportunity. So you're more of a um, timing the market rather than time in the market guy? I'm more of just buy things when they're cheap. So, uh, but I, so that means I rarely buy. So the last time I bought stocks, you know, maybe this is what your buddy was asking. Uh, the the last time I bought a lot of equities was March of 2020. Why? Because stuff was dirt cheap back then. In Mm -hmm. fact, in April of 2020, let's all remember that the price of oil was negative, negative $38 a barrel. Mm-hmm. So how do you know when something's cheap? When it's negative price, mm-hmm. <laughs> when it's a commodity that the whole world has to have and it's negative $38, that's when you want to go and buy. And if you just, for the rest of your investing life, if you buy things when they're that cheap and just sit and wait, and then when they get expensive and sell them, don't worry about the price, you're going to make a lot of money. You know, another good example, Rich, would be uh, real estate. So when I retired in 2012, I started investing in real estate in the United States. And like we said earlier, and I just got lucky, you know, I was looking at charts and I knew that it was cheap and it was cheap relative to its historic price and it was cheap relative to cash flow. Uh, So I did do that right. But I, I, the timing, you know, I I got completely lucky. So I pretty much went all in with uh, real estate, but I started selling those properties that I bought in 2012 and 2013. I started selling them rich in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I gradually sold them one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And I ended up selling the very last one in 2022. Now, did I start selling them in 2018 because I thought the prices were going to go down? I I, I didn't know. Who knows? They can keep going up. I have no idea. Did I sell the last one in 2022 because I thought, oh, my gosh, there's going to be a a real estate crash? No, that was not part. Now, I can talk about that on a whiteboard video, but that does not impact my decision making as far as my portfolio. The reason I sold those properties is not because I thought they was going to crash, but because they got to a point where, historically speaking, they were expensive. I completely ignored the price. CBDCs, you've talked a lot about central bank digital currencies. For those of you that are maybe newer to the concept or my channel, like the government is going to tokenize um, dollars on the blockchain and it's programmable money. They can program its value, the duration of its value, where you can and can't spend it. They can track where you do spend it or don't spend it. They could um, 
if they want to implement climate lockdowns, for example, and you're consuming too much meat or buying things that might contribute to what they might believe uh, harms the environment, they might restrict your access to buying those those certain things. So CBDCs are, 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 are very interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about CBDCs? When do you think they're going to be mainstream? Like when will we lose paper money and have to switch over to some sort of digital wallet that, that, that forces us to transact in their blockchain? So this is a very, very uh, extensive topic. I mean, this, this is like a two hour topic, but if I were to summarize, I would say, as far as the mechanics, I think it's very important for people to understand the mechanics of a CBDC, because when you hear this in the mainstream media or, or on financial Twitter, on YouTube, a lot of YouTube gurus, you know, talk about this and they talk about how we're going to come out with this fed coin. As mm. though it's going to be a different curve. You know, we already talked about CBDCs. Mm. Uh, that sounds different than a dollar. So somehow we're going to get these, uh, you know, dollars that we used to use, and now they're going to be replaced by, let's say, Fed coin. Y you've got to eliminate that thinking because that takes you down a path that leads you to very inaccurate conclusions. Okay, what you have to understand is that money itself, the way we think of money outside of green pieces of paper, is nothing but a ledger. That's it. So, Rich, I, I'm sure you have a, a few bank accounts. What th That bank account, that is not money. There, there's no money being stored for you in their safe. Mm. That is just that, that whole bank, all they're doing is keeping track of a ledger of who owes who what. And all these Arguably, it, you know, you could say that it exists today. Sorry? Arguably, you could say that central bank digital currencies exist today. Well, there you go. So a thought argument? experiment that I like to do is I ask people, how do you know that you're not spending a CBDC right now? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think they're going to come out and tell you? Absolutely not. So the point is a CBDC by definition is when all of these ledgers are consolidated onto one. If they're on just one ledger, then they can do all of these things, all these draconian or Orwellian big brother type of things that you described just a couple minutes ago. They can't do that unless you've got everything on one ledger or the ledgers are at least talking with one another. So you've got the BIS coming out the other day talking about this unified, a global unified ledger in terms of a CBDC. This is what I've been talking about on my channel for the last two years now, right? And what they're doing is you'll notice in this report, they don't talk necessarily about a, a different type of money or a different type of currency. It's all about unifying ledgers. So, and, and the reason I say this is because there's so many people that I see out there that are adamantly opposed to a CBDC, but they'll sit there and if the Fed says, okay, well, now instead of your deposits being a liability of Wells Fargo, you know, we don't have to worry about them going bust. You can just move them onto the Fed's balance sheet. Those same people would say, oh yeah, sure. That doesn't sound like a big problem that, you know, they'd pay me a higher interest rate. Why not? But they don't understand that that is a CBDC and they don't understand that the central planners aren't going to come out and tell you. They're not going to say, you know, doo, 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 today we're using this new CBDC. Why would they do that when they know that there's so much negative press there's so much negative PR on social media around the topic. People know that it's Big Brother. So what they're going to do, how they're going to roll this out, Rich, in my opinion, because this is exactly what I would do, if, you know, if you just put on the evil genius hat for a moment, <laughs> if you put on your Klaus Schwab hat, uh, you come to the conclusion that you only start rolling out the features of a CBC. So the feature, one of the features of everything beyond one ledger is you'll be able to settle transactions 24-7, 365, instantly, all over the world. So I know you're a Canadian. You probably have most of your currency units in Canadian dollars. So let's say that you take a trip down to Mexico. You know, we talked about that trip here. Mm -hmm. uh, or you talk about that trip you do annually. So you go down to Mexico, and let's just say that you're down there and you wanted to buy a property. Like, oh, man, I love it down here. Great, you know, beachfront. And but it's going to be a pain in the ass because you're going to have to wire that money from your account in Canada. It's going to have to come down to 
Mexico. You're going to have to set up an account. You're going to trade it from Canadian dollars into pesos. It's going to take all this paperwork, all this time. You're going to pay transaction fees. Then you've got to get it in the account of the seller. How do you do escrow? How do you, it's this big pain in the ass, right? Mm -hmm. Well, with a unified ledger, the CBDC world, if you will, if you were down there, you would instantly be able to transfer those currency units from Canada down to pesos. You'd instantly be able to transfer them from Canadian dollars to Mexican pesos, and you'd be able to direct them right into the account of the seller, all free, 24-7, 365. So this is one of the reasons why I don't think a CBDC will be thrust upon people. I think they'll actually demand it. I think that they'll they'll love it because the, the average Joe just doesn't understand what's happening here, right? So if I'm Klaus Schwab, I'm going to roll out those features just gradually. I'm not going to say that it's a CBDC. I'm going to say, look, now look at what you can do with this new banking system. We'll call it mm -hmm. FedNow. We've, we've set it up and, oh, it's so amazing. You can do this and you can do that. And people are going to say, yeah, 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 very, very cool. And then three, four, five years down the line, once they get everyone uh, on this network and once they integrate it into their life, then they're going to start rolling out the social score. Another uh, uh, thought experiment that I use with my audience is all of us, everyone on the live stream right now has a cell phone. And I would argue 99% of the people are probably addicted to it, even on this live stream right now, no matter what you say. So if I told you that tomorrow the government, the Canadian government or the U.S. government would start giving you a social score or a climate score based on your cell phone usage, how many of you would continue to use your cell phone? Every single person. Why? Because it's completely integrated into their life. They can't even leave home for five minutes without mm. their cell phone. They're just, and, and maybe your audience is a little bit different, Rich, but I mean, for heaven's sakes, go through an airport in Canada or in the United States. I mean, 99% of the people, what are they doing? They're, they're literally running into each other because they've just got their head buried mm -hmm. in their stupid phone, for heaven's sakes. So you're not, and what they're going to do is they're just going to rationalize it. Oh, yo, man, I don't want that social score. No, I know that's bad, but ah, you know, Rich is overplaying it on his channel. And George, he's just a fear monger. And you know, he's just doing clickbait. And he's just trying to, he's got the tinfoil hat on. So I don't know. I mean, is it really that bad? They're going to sit there and rationalize it, right? Mm -hmm. Just like people rationalize, uh, the, the blue pill guys sit there and rationalize why they should do this for a girl or why they should get her roses or why they should do that or why they shouldn't go to the gym. You know, they know they should, but then they rationalize it away to where they don't have to do it. And I think people are going to do the exact same thing with the CBDC. So that's what I would say first and foremost. Understand that it's a ledger. Understand that you're not going to know when they roll it out unless you're really, really, really paying attention. And then once you start paying attention, then you know that you want to try to transact in cash uh, as much as you can. And unfortunately, with Bitcoin and gold, it's it's very tough to transact. You know, try going a week in your life and only spending Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's 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 going to be difficult. You know, to pay your rent, to pay your uh, insurance, etc. But the the way that you've got to start thinking about it is how could I operate or how could I live outside of that ledger as much as possible. Now, the people are, that have nine to fives and jobs, and even for you and I, Rich, we're going to have to have some of our uh, net worth on that ledger because we've got to transact unless we want our uh, quality of life or standard of living to go down to like an Amish community, mm -hmm. right? If you don't want that, then some portion is going to have to operate within that ledger. But you want to try to get as much out of that ledger as you can, and that's where Bitcoin comes in. That's where gold comes in, and you take those uh, uh, you know, what you don't need as a store of value, then you take that, turn it into currency cash, and that's what you use to transact with as much as possible. So this really puts a premium for people who really value privacy and freedom and liberty and all these things. It really puts a, a premium on finding and setting up a plan B or C in countries where th the majority of transactions are still settled in cash. You know, I did a video on this the other day, Rich. Do you know that 78% of the transactions in places like Romania in Morocco are still settled in cash? So I'm not saying they'll never have a CBDC there, but what I am saying is that you got a lot more runway. And uh, for me, that that's that's very important. So I think you know I could go talk about it for two hours, but I guess I'll stop mm -hmm. there. 
They, they rolled out a central bank digital currency in some cities in China. Did you did you hear about how they did that? Oh, sure. They just give people free money. I mean, that's another yeah. way. You know, they, yeah, they just basically say, hey, gave we'll them a wallet. They said, here's here's fifty dollars worth of whatever our you know free free currency is, and, and apparently nobody pushed back on it. They were all happy to get that free money and and start using it to move them in that direction. How do yeah, you see I mean, that? look if so. The other day, I went on Twitter. And I said that you have to acknowledge the features of a CBDC or a unified ledger in the eyes of Joe Public. And I said, I think that the free market may even gravitate towards a CBDC. And of course, I have all the Bitcoiners and gold people. I mean, they're just literally losing their mind, right? Their heads are exploding. And I said, no, you, you've get, and of course they don't understand what I'm saying. What I'm really saying is if you're fighting John Jones, maybe the best UFC fighter at all times, let's say that you're going into the octagon with him in six weeks. Are you going to focus strictly on his weaknesses? Of course not. You're going to look at his weaknesses, but you're also going to look at his strengths because how the hell are you going to defeat him? If you don't look at everything in its, in its uh, entirety, and then you know how and what strategy you can use to actually having a chance of beating this guy. So we have to look at you know how this CBDC thing rolls out and why the public will gravitate to it. We talked about the ease of use, but then you bring up a great point. They're, of course, going to roll out uh, universal basic income especially when we have the next recession, if it turns into an economic depression, you know, we're going to see the same stimmy nonsense that we saw in 2020 and in 2021. And the easiest way to send out stimmies is to do what? To have everyone have an account at the Federal Reserve instead of their local bank. And then the Fed can take those bank reserves, call it base money, and they can inject that straight into the economy to try to give it uh, an economic boost, you know, it's that Keynesian type of mentality. Also, you know, I saw, in fact, do you know what the Mises Institute is? No. The Mises Institute is one of, of, of the big libertarian uh, think tanks in the United States. I mean, they're, they're, in fact, they're amazing. They're really, really good. But I saw someone with the Mises Institute retweet uh, this, this um, article where they were arguing how wrong it is that Jamie Dimon, you know, he's in charge of J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. uh, how he, in, in other words, J.P. Morgan, their reserves or their cash balance, their checking account that they have with the Fed, they get paid like 5% on that. It's actually a little bit more, but let's just say 5%. Where if you actually bank with J.P. Morgan, they're only paying you like 50 basis points. Right. So the article was like, why is how is this fair? On what planet is this right? No, 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 no. We should all be paid the exact same amount as JP Morgan or Jamie Dimon. Why, why should he get more on his cash reserves than we do? The average mm. Joe and Jane. But so the solution there is what? Well, you just move your account from JP Morgan over to the Fed and the Fed will pay you the exact same interest rate. But what does that do? Now, all of a sudden, you've got the CBDC. So they. Oops, sorry about that. They can pay you whatever interest rate they want. They can issue universal basic income. You have all these efficiencies of the transactions. They can also issue uh, uh, credit based on narrative, not based on merit. Because, see, if there's only one balance sheet, the, can't, the bank can't go bust, right? So the Federal Reserve, they cannot go bust. So if the lending is going through the Federal Reserve, and those assets, those loans end up on their balance sheet, they don't care about them getting paid back. Where a normal bank, they have to take into consideration your credit score, obviously, because they have a PL and l mm -hmm. and they, they want to get paid back on that loan. But the Fed doesn't fall into that category. They cannot go bust. So if you, and the way I always describe it, is in the future, when we go into this CBDC world, Dylan Mulvaney will get a loan with 0% interest, I assure you regardless of what his credit score is. Where Rich Cooper, it'll be almost impossible for him to get a loan for anything under a 10% interest rate. You see where I'm going with that? Because mm -hmm. although you, from a merit standpoint, 
a bank would far prefer to loan to you, but that's not the way the Fed's thinking. See, they're thinking in terms of, of politics and whoever, whatever disadvantaged group, let's say, has political favor, they're the ones that are going to be getting the loans. It's not going to be the, the the straight white guys. I can assure you of that, so especially the straight so white guys that drive cars that get five miles to the gallon. Yeah, so they're definitely going to be weaponizing that agenda. So you're so to your point of of being able to opt out of it somehow with something like Bitcoin is definitely useful. Um, I made a note here to ask you about Fed Pay. Fed now. Fed now. Yeah, I think it's Fed now is what you're referring to. No, I was. I'm not sure if we're talking about the same thing now because I was talking to a few of my guys uh, a week or so ago, and the topic of Fed Fed Pay has come up which is hmm. supposed to uh, compete with things like PayPal and Visa and stuff like that. Um, it, it's it's loosely tied into what I would understand as a CBDC because it's a way to move money around at a very, very low rate uh, to get you on their um, sheets rather than using things like PayPal. Yeah. Does that sound... Is that is that Fed now? Maybe I misunderstood the name of it. It, it, it might be fed now, but, but regardless, so that in and of itself really isn't a CBDC because, again, your uh, Canadian dollars or my dollars are a liability of a commercial bank. Mm. So that's just a way to transact between bank now uh, from bank to bank or from individual to individual, business to business. But I will say that although that's not a CBDC, that is the back end plumbing. Mm. So that makes the transition far easier. So if our dollars become a liability of the Federal Reserve, if they're tokenized, like you were saying earlier, and we have this unified ledger, maybe it's even a global unified ledger managed by the BIS, the FedNow system that they just came out with, or I think they come out with that, it might actually be in July, it's either June or July of this year. So pretty much as we speak, um, that, that, it, that makes the mechanics, the back end plumbing a lot easier. Mm. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just going to catch up on some of these super chats because some of them sort of piled back. Uh, Brett Johnson Brent. milkshake. Brett Johnson milkshake theory seems to be playing out RF now. I'm guessing that's right F and now. Even A Taggart seems to be describing George Gammon's crack up boom phenomenon. It's playing out. Uh, he followed that up. It seems. Yeah, I don't know if it's a opinions. crack up boom. I, I wouldn't. Um, yeah, I wouldn't describe it as a crack up boom. He's talking about my good buddy Adam Taggart and Brent Johnson. Um, I would just say that, you know, I just did a video, Rich, where I, I pulled up a chart that was uh, really fascinating. In fact, I could probably do a screen share and bring it up. If you want me to bring it up, I can. But what yeah, I did. Yeah, sure, throw it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see if I can do. I think your audience would really like this. Yeah, it'll pop up in a second, so I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. Okay, I'm going to do this. It's good I use, uh, use um, stream right. all the time. So let me go over to my email and pull this up. My my research assistant, Josh, who, by the way, is a you're, big fan of yours. Cool. Let me know when uh, you're clear for me to put it up on the screen. Yeah, so we're good to go. All right, here you go. Can you see this, Rich? Yeah, it's up on the screen now. Here, let me go okay. more full screen, see if we can get that a little bit bigger for everybody. Okay. Yeah, so this it, it pertains to kind of what I was saying earlier. But we've got... Uh, the past inversions of the 10-year and the three-month. So again, when that three-month yield is higher than the 10-year, that would be an inversion of the curve. And you can see that it goes back to 1969. So we had it in 69, 73, 80, 89, 2000, 2006, 2019, and currently. So it says it's basically how many months we've gone since that inversion and then what the stock market usually does and how long it takes for it to hit its absolute bottom. And you can see where we are right now. You see, that's the black line. Mm -hmm. So usually uh, the, the stocks don't hit their bottom, like I was saying earlier, for let's call it 16 months, 18 months, until after the curve is inverted. So we're only eight months in. That gives us another 10 months. Mm. But even though the stock market is going up here, I really wouldn't call that a crack-up boom because the, the proper definition of a crack-up boom 
is uh, the stock market going up as a result of consumer price inflation and the dollar just rapidly, rapidly, rapidly losing value. It's something you usually see in a hyperinflation type of scenario. But right now, the headline CPI in the United States has gone from 9% all the way down to 4%. And I think this month, July, you're going to see it go all the way down to probably 3%. Um, so again, I wouldn't call this a crack up boom, but I would say that this is a, uh, a, a bull market, um, but it's picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, as you can see by this chart. Mm, yeah, it's a real good way to distill it, I guess. Pennies in front of a steamroller. Nobody wants to do that. It's about the dumbest thing you could do. Uh, <laughs> got one here from Eric. He says, hey, George, I'm 30, and it seems like the game nowadays is rigged. Uh, real estate is out of hand, losing money to rent, cash eroding to inflation, how to move forward in life in this environment. So this is like kind of like the average show guy. Like how would you, what's your advice for that, for that guy? Well, uh, number one, patience, because I think within the next six months, within the next year, you're going to have a lot of opportunity. A lot of those assets that you've wanted to buy that may seem quote unquote out of reach are oh. going to be well within reach. And uh, and another great thing, Eric, yes, I, I agree that the system is rigged against you. But right now you can get five and a half percent, for heaven's sakes, on a short term T-bill. That's not bad. And I know that the headline CPI understates inflation, but to get five and a half percent, you know, the, especially compared to the pretty much zero percent that you could get on your checking account or savings account for the last 12 years. Um, that's not too bad. In fact, the other day in my model portfolio, I, I have a, a investment group, like you've got your men's group, Rich, mm -hmm. and I have a model portfolio in there where I put a hundred thousand dollars and it's pretty much all in gold, about 10% gold and 90% in T-bills. But all the, the money I've made just on the interest in T-bills, I was able to go out the other day and buy puts, on the s p 500 so that's just a bet that it goes down but i did that with the house's money mm -hmm. the house's money mm -hmm. is just from the interest that i'd made from these t-bills so that's uh you know an opportunity that you have now eric that you just didn't have over the last 12 years to actually make money on your dry powder while you wait for things to get cheap um i did this tweet the other week i want to i want to read it off um to you guys um rather than putting up on the screen but it but it got a lot of engagement. There was like 21,000 likes, two and a half million views on it. It's not too long, so I'll just read it out. It says, Western culture is a scam for men. You get up early to pay for a house you hardly live in. You don't own the land it sits on. To pay a mortgage to a bank that lent you pretend money made out of thin air, you pay interest on. They don't even have on deposit in a vault to drive a car that's primarily used to get to and from work, usually on congested and broken roads. Your tax money never seems to fix. You then pay 30 to 50 percent income tax to the government for a job, capital J, capital O, capital B, designed to keep you just over broke. Mm. Uh, job to me is an acronym, just over broke. While the government yeah. spends your money on programs you generally don't agree with. To buy stuff with sales tax with money we have already paid income taxes on to impress people we don't even like with things we generally don't even care about. And if you do well with your investments with income you've already been taxed on, you pay more tax on tax in the form of capital gains tax to the government on money you took the risk on investing. All this usually to impress a woman enough to commit to you that has already shared her body with dozens of other men, but brings baggage to the table that if you live with or marry can take half your shit, your kids, if she changes her mind about you. And I said, what did I miss? And you know, people sort of chimed in with a few other things. That that kind of leads me to, I mean, it's kind of what Eric was talking about there, but it, but it also leads me to the notion of the passport bros. Do you know what passport bros are? No. So you're you're kind of a, a passport bro, but you're the kind of guy I think is a better example because what you've done is you've is you've geolocated yourself where you're not exposed just to one country or one market with one passport. You're in uh, Colombia right now. You've got access to different places in the world. Um, you're that guy that I think should should be modeled after. See. <laughs> Whenever I say passport bros, George, um, I always get emails and DMs from guys that are like your typical pickup artists with like, you know, the painted nails and the funny hats and all that shit and the high heel boots. And they're like, hey, I'm a passport bro. Can I come on your podcast and tell everybody about my program and my course and all that bullshit? You're not that guy. You're actually doing it. 
can you can you talk a little bit more about how you structured your life and why you've structured it this way and why you have multiple passports and you move back and forth from different countries and what that looks like for you and why you chose that? Well, I'm 50 years old. I've never been married. Uh, I don't plan on being married. It's interesting because I stumbled across your content and Rolo's content maybe, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago, something like that. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't know the red pill community. I, I didn't understand. I didn't even know these concepts were a thing, but oddly enough, it was just the way that I had already chosen to live my life. As, you know, spinning plates as an example. Mm. Uh, that just was just kind of seemed like a no brainer. Uh, to me from the time I was about 13 years old. <laughs> like, why would I not do that? You know? <laughs> uh, but I've always kind of uh, lived that that type of lifestyle, I guess. And also, I like to be in places that, uh, where I enjoy spending time, right? So if you're the average type of guy, you, you like being surrounded by, uh, you know, good-looking women. You like good weather, you like making money. And uh, for me, there's a lot of places that you can do that, maybe even better uh, than the United States or in the West. And prior to retiring, I actually made most of my money outside the US. So I was very comfortable in uh, you know coming down to Ecuador, coming down to South America, coming down to Colombia. Now, originally I came down here as an investment opportunity. That was back when uh, oil was cheap in 2014, 15, it got under 30 a barrel. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to play oil, but I didn't know anything about it. So I started investing in real estate here because it was denominated in pesos, which is loosely tied to oil. But once I started coming here more and more, I'm like, man, the weather is fantastic. The women are beautiful. The people in general are just exceptional. They're very, just very welcoming, very nice. They're always enjoying themselves, having fun. In fact, you know what was funny is I went to a boxing class this morning, and I've been doing that to try to, you know, rehabilitate my shoulder and whatnot. And there were a few gals in this boxing class, and you know, usually it's at a hardcore boxing gym where they're usually playing like ACDC and uh, you know Metallica and Pantera and and bands like that but every once in a while they'll stuff. play yeah that's right but every once in a while i noticed that they play like a salsa song okay and all the gals even the gals that were there like you know with the gloves on as soon as that salsa music hit rich they they just couldn't control themselves they just the hips are moving they have to start dancing salsa <laughs> like, and it's the same thing whether you go to a club or you go to a restaurant it's just the people here really know how to enjoy life yeah. Um, and then it, the, the standard of living is incredibly high. In fact, you know, I've got my uh, a maid that does all my cooking. She, I've got special meal preparation. I've got a driver that drives me around on the weekends. Um, e the food is incredible. It's all grown, uh, not all, but a lot of it is grown locally. They've mm -hmm. got lakes around here where I always go well, wakeboarding and renting boats. And I know you're a big boat guy. Uh, in fact, that's how I, I messed up my shoulder is wakeboarding the other day. I dislocated it pretty bad. But, um, and then you've got access to a, a lot more, I think the percentage of women down here that would fall into a category of what most guys would consider good looking is way higher. I mean, pretty much higher than I've ever seen anywhere on the planet. I've been to over 45 countries, mm -hmm. but it's going to be, uh, you know, night and day difference between like the United States or Canada or someplace in the West. Now that said, a lot of guys come down here that uh, I'll just try to put it in uh, you know, kind of red pill lingo. A lot of guys that are like two and threes back in the United States and in Canada mm -hmm. come down here and they think they're going to be a 10 mm -hmm. and all these, you know, just smoking hot Colombian gals are going to just gravitate towards them just because they exist when they're, you know, 300 pounds, they're making two grand a month and they're, you know, wearing jean shorts and, and, and Birkenstocks or something like that. Mm -hmm. And th those guys are going to have a rude awakening because there's a lot of dudes down here that are, that are alpha, that are very high value guys that are Colombians, mm -hmm. not just, not just gringos. 
So now it is true that your uh, SMV will go up. So if you're a three in the United States, here you might be a, a four mm -hmm. or a five, but you're not going to a 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can tell you that. You still got to put in the work. You still got to strive for excellence. And at the end of the day, the gals down here are hardwired the exact same way that they're hardwired in the States or in Canada. Um, although I would argue that they're not as focused on um, things like social media, uh, which is it's nice. And there are some uh, slight differences there that I think at the end of the day probably make a big difference. But, um, you know, that's pretty much the, the I never really thought about, you know, designing a life. Um, I just kind of did what I, I wanted to do. And this is just kind of how it turned out, I guess. Well, it turned out pretty good. I mean, I, I saw a, a video that that popped into my feed. I don't know if it was on the homepage or a channel that I'm subscribed to, but you kind of, you're kind of doing some vlogging and you're on a helicopter ride uh, to a lake somewhere for lunch. And there was a couple of gals with you and a friend of yours. Yeah, yeah. You know the one that I'm... That I'm yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so is that something that you're doing on the regular now where you're doing like vlogging on sort of like lifestyle stuff that you're up to in Colombia or I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to try. I, I did those, uh, about a month ago and I was setting up that channel with my mm -hmm. research assistant, Josh. And, uh, I just, you know, Rich, I don't know if you've ever dislocated your shoulder. I'm sure probably some people in your audience, but I, I did it really, really bad where I tore my rotator and I tore all these tendons and I, mm. I couldn't even move. It was it was really, really bad. And still, I, I can't I don't have full range of motion. And um, I heard it about two months ago and about a month ago, I got to the point where I could start like kind of going to the gym and mm. kind of just moving it. And I've got a physical therapist that I work with daily, but I've just been focusing almost 100% of my time and energy on just rehabbing my shoulder and getting back to 100%. So I kind of put that on hold. But yeah, once I get my shoulder back to uh, normal, we'll definitely start cranking out those videos. I've got like probably 10 vlogs mm -hmm. just on a hard drive that we just haven't released yet because I haven't been able to go through the final edit. But one of my reasons for doing that is because, you know, it just goes back to like the, the, the community of guys that, that you serve. Um, I, I think that a lot of those guys would really enjoy someplace like Columbia, but they've just got this mental like block, right? Like they're, oh, I can't go down there. As soon as I go down there, I'm going to get decapitated. I'm going to get kidnapped. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a third world country. It's blah, 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 blah. So I really wanted to show on these vlogs, you know, how life really is here for someone that's I, I don't know if i want to consider myself a, a high value guy you know but for, for for a high value guy someone that has resources mm -hmm. and someone that's out there making their dent in the world like you always say mm -hmm. uh, how a place like columbia could get, be an even better option as far as not just from a standpoint of women but a standpoint of from a standard of living a uh, much better option than maybe canada or uh, the United States. I mean, taking that helicopter up to Guadalupe is something I usually do maybe once a month or a couple times a month. I just go up there for lunch. I, it's about a 20 minute helicopter ride and I just bring it right back. And that's something that I probably, I, I don't know, even if you had the resources, I don't know if you could just, you know, take a helicopter for a, for lunch really quick. What does it cost for a $20 helicopter ride up there for, for lunch? A twenty-minute helicopter ride. Twenty minutes. Uh, back and forth is about fifteen hundred bucks. Fifteen hundred USD. Yeah, USD. Okay. Yeah. So, so about fifteen hundred, and we leave at like eleven, and then we get up there uh, around, uh, you know, eleven thirty, twelve, something like that. Mm -hmm. Have lunch, hang out, go out to pay for a few hours, go to Pinole, do some touristy things, and hop right back in the, uh, in the helicopter, come back. You're ready to take a shower, go to dinner, and go out for the night. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that, that that guy's is how the passport bro, in my view, you know, would would want to approach it because, like George mentioned earlier, a lot of guys that try to tackle this lifestyle, they're like a two or three, and they think they're going to be a ten when they go somewhere else, and they don't learn game, and they don't understand what women respond to, and they don't know, um, you know, how women actually operate. 
women are women pretty much yeah. everywhere yeah. around the world. They're all Absolutely. pushed by the exact same, you know, desires as George said, you know, he's been to 45 countries, so he's nodding his head on that one. Let me just see what we got here. Uh, outstanding content. Salute big brother, George rich. Keep leading from front. Thanks, man. Uh, my truth says people want to shame passport bros because they are positioning themselves to be in a better position, regardless of Tradcon, purple pill passport, bro. You need to be red pill aware period. Mm. Rest of the sheep can go pound sand and pull the yoke. Thank you both. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. You know, most guys do do mess it up. And I would discourage you from trying to. I mean, you know, how can I put this? And, you know, Rich, most of the guys that I see, most of the gringos that come down here. I mean, you can tell right off the bat if they're down here to enjoy and invest and to strive for excellence. Or if they're just down here, you know, because they can't get laid in, in the states they can't right. get laid i mean yeah. you can tell those guys right off the bat but it, it's really stems from laziness mm -hmm. right because uh, what i see just so um it, it's just so apparent that these guys are like okay i've got a choice either i've got to stay here in the united states and compete with all these other guys and that would require me going to the gym that would require me you know taking better care of my finances that would require me getting out there and getting outside my comfort zone and that would require me doing things that are difficult mm -hmm. getting off my ass and making shit happen right so I, that's option number one and this is in their minds right mm -hmm. or they think or i could just go to columbia and be a lazy broke slob and then i can still have access to the women, in fact, maybe better women than I would have by doing all this work in the United States. Mm -hmm. So 95% of the guys that come down here, the gringos, they do it from a, a place of laziness, right? And what they find is that obviously it doesn't work out because they they find that, you know, it's the exact same, uh, the exact same setup for them here, that they're just as much of a loser as they were in the United States. So my, my main point there is you can find places outside of the United States that may have, you know, prettier gals or maybe a better standard of living or maybe something that you would enjoy more based on your priorities. But the, the, the fundamentals of what Rich talks about on his channel, they do not change. I mean, I'm down here. I'm for, you know, my, my income level or net worth or whatever you don't want to measure. It, it's extreme extremely extremely high here um you know i'm a six foot four guy which helps uh i have all these things that you would maybe consider advantages in the dating pool here but i'm still doing every single thing i can to put in the work to get better to improve you know uh i'm always trying to work on my finance always trying to work on my health always trying to work on my physique always trying to get better um, you know, and forget the women, you got to do that for yourself as well. That's got to be your number one priority. Yeah. Women. I mean, it doesn't matter if she's in Arizona or if she's in Colombia or Eastern Europe. Um, you know, women can smell losers. They, you know, they know what, it, like if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. Like, you know, they can, they can pick out losers. It, it doesn't matter where you geo, geo relocate. If you haven't learned game and figured out, you know, you and loving yourself up is never going to matter anyway. Um, you mentioned you hurt your shoulder. Have you, have you looked into like that medical tourism stuff that happens a lot in South America where they do like stem cell injections and peptides to sort of like work that through? I have. Yeah. In fact, one of the most famous stem cell, uh, places uh i don't know if you call it a hospital or a facility clinic whatever is yeah. right here it's about okay. 10 minutes up the street from me it's in tesoro and in fact um i've got a mastermind group with kenny mackerel i think you know kenny yeah and uh and jason hartman and uh our last mastermind meetup is in nashville uh michael chandler was there i don't know do you know michael chandler he's in the ufc he was slated to fight conor mcgregor mm -hmm. but anyway uh, I've played golf with him and Kenny a few times, and he was there hanging out with the members. And I actually asked him about it specifically. I said, hey, have you been to that clinic or have you done stem cell? And he said that he had not, but uh, several, several of his buddies in the UFC have done that. And they've had a lot of success with it. And uh, even some of them, he said, have come down to this clinic in Medellin. And... Um, so for, for me right now, it's kind of my plan B. 
Uh, I've been working really, really hard. I've been going to the boxing because boxing is so much shoulder, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that in the mornings. I've been working with my physical therapist in the afternoon. And after I work with my physical therapist, I go to the gym. I do that every single day. Uh, How long have you been boxing? Well, I started taking boxing classes back in 2012 when I retired and I did it for about a year and then I didn't do it after that. But to rehab my shoulder, I thought it would be perfect. So I've been doing that. And so the bottom line is I got about two more months on rehab. And if I'm not at 100 percent at that time, then I'm going to consider the, the, Try stem, the stem cells, cells like stuff, a plan yeah. B. Yeah. Did you ever um, put yourself in an environment where you had like a competitive sort of fight before you hurt your shoulder, shoulder since 2012 where you're like testing yourself? No, but I'd love to. It's I'd great. love to. It's great. Yeah. I did my yeah. first fight um, it was like two or three months ago. And, um, you know, I've been training for three, three and a half years. And I thought to myself, you know, I've been training for boxing, uh, boxing, yeah, boxing, boxing, you know, so, so I've been training for like three, three and a half years. And I was fortunate enough to have a guy that ran a gym that wasn't a pussy. So when the whole scamdemic thing blew up, he just, he just kept running it. You know, we had like a backdoor code way to get, get in sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I said to my, uh, coach, I said, you know, coach, like I've been doing this long enough. Like, you know, do you think I'm ready to actually test this and have a fight? And he, he said, yeah, yeah. So. So we set it up. I mean, I was expecting him to find somebody, you know, close to my age, maybe like, you know, skill level sort of thing. But um, he put me up against somebody in his network who was 20 years younger, two inches taller and 35 pounds heavier. Wow. And I two inches to, taller. You're a tall guy, aren't you? Yeah, I'm six foot two. So he's about he's about your height. He's about six. Foot wow. Four. And dude, I'll be honest with you. Like I was scared, you know, at first he <laughs> gave me this book. You know, the book was. um What's the title of the book? The Custom Auto Mind. And uh, the author of the book is Remus Boxing. I guess it's some sort of boxing studio. He goes here. Read this to get your head squared away because it's like the whole fear thing will really get to you. So it's like, you know, you have to reestablish your mindset from fearful to you've trained, you've put in the reps, you've done the work, you deserve the win. Um, I also brought three people that were important to me to watch the fight because I didn't want to let them down and I wanted to make sure that I was going to be held accountable in front of them for all the training that I did. Great. But I can see why people do it now. Like it's, um, I mean, I only did it once and I just edged him out. Like I barely beat him, but I got in some, that's really cool. Yeah. But I got in some nice shots and it felt really good. It's, it's something that I highly recommend that you do. Like once your shoulders fixed to like test yourself out and you know, just put yourself in an environment where it's, it's, it's two, three minute rounds and just do it, man. It's, it's great. It really is. I would absolutely love to do that. I remember, uh, in the the boxing gym I was going to in Vegas, it was really hardcore. I mean, they didn't even have air conditioning in Las Vegas. That's how hardcore it was. That's hot. And I never got into the ring, but a a couple of times when there were some, uh, bigger heavyweight guys that were the pros, uh, they were getting into the ring just to kind of spar a little bit. They they would ask me if I'd kind of like warm them up. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't care where I hit them because I had no prayer of hitting them. Uh, mm-hmm. But they'd say, okay, well, we just, you know, we'll kind of just hit you a little bit, but we're not going to hit in the face. So no mm-hmm. problem. I remember, Rich, these guys, like these, you know, 230 pound heavyweight box, like pro boxers, they would just give me a little love tap, like mm-hmm. pap, pap, just like that, like right in the rib cage. And mm-hmm. it would just buckle me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would just, I mean, people don't understand how bad, like a little kidney punch from a professional boxer that yeah. weighs 230 pounds. They don't understand how bad that hurts. But, you know, a quick story. Um, back in 2017, I was spending a lot of time in Tucson helping out my brother. So I was going across the border into Mexico and into Nogales uh, very frequently. And, you know, you just walk across the border. And um, one time I walked across the border and I saw this gal and this kid there. And they're asking for donations because he was a pro boxer and he was trying to go to a big tournament mm. in uh, in Mexico City. And he was like kind of the local champ for his okay. age group. And this kid was maybe, you know, 16, uh, 17, something like that. And he probably weighed 140 pounds. So, you know, I clock in at probably 200, you know, 195, something like that. Mm. So uh, I, I thought to my, and I always, you know, people that don't know me don't know this, but uh, I always do crazy stuff. I, I'm very, this is just kind of par for the course. So I went up there and I said, well, how much do you need for the, how much are you trying to solicit, you know? And she she said, oh, we need $100 for the whole trip. Mm-hmm. I said, listen, I'll pay the $100 right now, but I'm going to be here in Nogales for the next week. 
Mm-hmm. So I, I I used to train a little bit, you know, and I want to get into, you know, keep up the, the good shape and whatnot, you know, going to the gym. So I said, I want to go in there and spar with the kid. Okay. And I'll give you the hundred dollars right now. And they, you know, they looked at me like I was crazy and they said, fine, you know, no problem. We'll take the hundred dollars. So I met him at his gym at like three o'clock that afternoon. Now his gym, of course, is just the garage for mm-hmm. his trainer. Fortunately, his trainer spoke a little bit of English and there's kind of this makeshift ring there. And so he's like, he, I come in there and he kind of has this grin on his face and he's like, okay, so you want to spar with, with the champ, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I don't know a lot about it. I took it for about a year, but I'm so much bigger than he is. I figured mm-hmm. it'd kind of be fair if we had all the pads. Mm-hmm. And he goes, actually, you know, why don't you see, why don't you watch him warm up real quick here? And then you can maybe reevaluate your decision. And so he, the kid gets in there and Rich, the guy is like Floyd Mayweather. He's mm-hmm. like, bah, bah, bah. I mean, he is the fastest I have ever seen. He looks like Oscar De La Hoya in there. And then, you know, he does that for like 30 seconds. And then, of yeah. course, they look at me and like, you still want to spar with him? <laughs> I was like, yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea. So they, we all laughed and had a good time. But what they allowed me to do is actually train with him okay. for three hours a day, three okay. hours a day for the whole week that I was there. And Rich, it was the most insane workouts I have ever been through. I mean, it was yeah. like like a Navy SEAL type training thing. And the kid does that every single day, two hours of the most intense cardio you have ever gone through. And the final hour is just straight boxing. Yeah, boxing is a wild cardio workout. Nobody, like if you haven't done it, you don't understand how yeah. how much work is involved. Like after three two-minute rounds in the fight that I did, I was, dude, I was soaked from head to toe. Yeah. I was just covered in sweat. And this was before summer too. This is like in early spring, so it wasn't even that, that, that hot. And you're completely out of breath. Like it took me at least four or five minutes to catch my breath after that. Mexico spits out some really, really good fighters. Yeah. Um, I was actually surprised that you wanted to take him on. You got you got bigger balls than me, man, but at least you were smart enough not to let him <laughs> scrap with you. Yeah, um, yeah, that would not have been a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I would do it again. I would, uh, I would... Uh, I would definitely, you know, consider doing it again just for. Uh, yeah, I would love I to get in there. I, I noticed on the bulletin board in the gym today, they they said it's in Spanish. I didn't know what is totally saying, but something like a league. They've got like something oh, yeah. like that. So, yeah, my number one goal is to get the shoulder back to normal, uh, get back to the shape that I was in prior to the injury, and then I want to just keep going and going and going and improving to the point where hopefully I can do something like that. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, and there's a lot of stuff that I would have really liked to have talked about, but I but I've got a hard stop in ten minutes because I gotta I gotta run. But um, anything you want to give the audience to sort of like find you at, or any channels you want them to subscribe to, like where do you want them to go? They can just Google my name, and I've got two YouTube channels, just the George Gammon channel, which are whiteboard videos based on kind of me explaining the back end plumbing like we were doing earlier so if you mm-hmm. enjoyed that you'd probably like the that channel or the rebel capitals channel is where i just do live streams like this and with that i i talk about the plumbing i talk about macro talk about investing but i also talk a lot about uh liberty freedom free market capitalism you know that i originally set up that channel to push back against the mandates mm-hmm. that we had in 2021 yeah and uh, the, the channel got deleted. Uh, fortunately, Joe Rogan was nice enough to uh, kind of retweet it. And once he did that, YouTube put it back on. That was another interesting story. But uh, yeah, and then the podcast is just the the Rebel Capitalist shows. So you can look up any of those and follow me if you'd like. Yeah, check it out. I mean, if you guys want to get some clarity on markets from George's perspective, I, I think he does a really good job of trying to simplify it so that it's not complex. And it really shouldn't be complex. I mean, anything that's that's made too complex complex in an explanation it's like come on man like let's you know let's simplify this thing down so yeah check him out and um yeah give him a follow we'll definitely catch up and talk talk again soon maybe we'll do another one in like six or seven months on my channel but it's always it's always good to catch up and uh see what's up thanks george yeah thanks 